Hi, good morning and welcome to today's provider meeting. Pam, take it away. Okay. <laughs> oh, oops. Great turn. Um, she also forgot there's snacks up there. So if anybody is feeling, you know, a little hangry or jittery from their coffee, there's water and uh, granola bars and um, bananas. So I just wanted to really quickly do a mid-year recap. We're about halfway through this year, which is amazing to think about, right? Um, as to where we, our intentions were for this year. So I don't know if any of you, maybe some of you were with us in November. And in November, we were kind of preparing for 2023 as far as what we were, what we were hoping to learn. Um, and we did a whole session about the process of change. And we talked about, um, I think the question was like, if you weren't here right now, what do you think you would be doing? And those of you are right now, where do you think your mind is trying to you know, take you away from um, here to go to? And we wrote all those down and we had a dumpster fire. You guys remember that? Yeah, okay. So there was a dumpster fire because what was in the dumpster was all of the system things that were taking our focus away from people, right? And so we wanted to figure out how do we bring our intention and our focus back to people? Um, and so we showed you a equation and I'm not a math person, but I, I did get this one. So, and it was dissatisfaction times vision times first steps. You have to have all three of those, and, and when you do, it's greater than resistance. If any one of those is a zero, then what's that whole side going to be? If you're multiplying anything by a zero, it is, right? So then you can't get, your resistance will always win, right? So we, um, so this satisfaction was clear. We had that. Um, next was vision. And so this year, we really want to spend time on mindset and vision. Um, and we've sprinkled in some first steps, but really, how do we get our minds to a place where we can see something new? Um, so, I went on a journey and looked throughout the state to figure out who was doing things differently, who was thinking differently, and why. And so I invited them to come, and all of them were providers, and to come and talk with providers about these new ways of thinking so that you could see other ways of doing business and, and supporting people. Um, so January, we had Sarah Milliman come from Toledo, and she did a trauma timeline of our system. So we looked at kind of the historical um, lens of our system and all the things that had happened to it. February, we had Tim and Bridget come, um, was from Starfire, and they talked about the social patterns of disability. Um, and one of the ways to see a new path is to recognize the path you're on. Those are my words, but that was basically how we, what they laid out for us. Um, March, uh, we had leadership, because that was a request, is that providers wanted some more insight into some leadership um, support. And we also looked at different funding streams. So we had somebody come from the Fairfield Foundation, because one of the things we recognize is that if you always rely on system support, Medicaid dollars, to do person-centered support, it won't, it won't happen. It won't happen successfully. So what you have to do is be more creative in where you're getting your money from, right? So that's what we brought um, in March. April, we had Katie Bachmeyer and Candace Peelman come, and they were with Bachmeyer Press. This was more um, about the stories we tell and the way we, we present and talk about people with disabilities. And if we're looking for um, connections or we're looking for uh, success, then we have to look at that language and how we're presenting uh, and how people are being presented. Uh, May, we had Andy Maidlow, this was last month, from Community Supports Incorporated, and what he was sharing was uh, their journey to becoming a trauma-responsive organization. So that was something else that providers have asked for was uh, more information and insight on that process and what that looks like and why. And then now we're back to June, not back, first time we've been here. Um, we're in June, and we have Tim and Bridget back, and so they're going to talk about the historical shapes of social devaluation. Some big words in that, but they're going to break them down and make sure that it all makes sense. Go for it. Okay. Well, thank you all. Um, some familiar faces from last time in February. Is that what you said? Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> so we're back. Um, and we'll talk more about what we're going to do. One, we came, we do have raffle tickets for those um, participation, um, some gift cards that we'll give out at the end. Um, and we'll get into the content. But first, Rachel has agreed to kind of share her um, a bit about her um, family and some things they worked on with Starfire to kind of get us in the space here. 
Kristen, you want to pull the PowerPoint up first? Sure. <clears throat> that button on that screen, too, Oh. Oh. I don't know why it's not on there now. Uh, hold, please. Technical difficulties. Did you do the optimize too? I'm sure you did. I should have had it on there from earlier. One minute, please. All right, Pam. How many jokes? Tells me jokes while I'm standing here. I don't know why it's not doing it, Pam. Somebody try share? Sure. Oh, it just says it's paused. What do we start PowerPoint. It just says my screen is paused. What? Did you just stop share? Oh. <laughs> That's. Okay. Do you want to try? I don't know why there's teams. Maybe like a snack. <laughs> 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 Yeah, I had those up. You're cutting into my seven minutes. Oh, oh yeah. Sorry, there we go. There we go. There it is. I don't even know. I have to Thank you. Sure same thing. Good. I'm on there again. Okay. <laughs> All right. So before Tim and Bridget get started, I want to give you a little bit of um, a story about a family project that I had the opportunity to do through Starfire. Sorry. That's okay. I'm just okay. staying around. Okay. So I was given the opportunity to participate in a family project. Um, a friend of mine told me about Starfire and their mission, and it was right up my alley. Um, I believe that every person should be given the opportunity to find true passion in their lives and share that gift with others. So after I met my mentor, Carol, I was immediately ready to go on my project. So you can go to slide two. So that's a picture of our project, and that's my family. So my son Cooper loves hockey and he has since the fourth grade when an amazing teacher came into his life that was passionate about hockey. That's her up there by the cannon. Stephanie Wright came into Cooper's life um, with her passion about hockey, spread it to him. And now we rarely ever see him without a hockey jersey on or a hockey t-shirt of some kind. He's had birthday parties, Halloween costumes, Valentine boxes, all of the things. Um, he had surgery when a few years ago and both of his legs were in casts and of course he picked Columbus Blue Jackets um, colors. So his love for hockey grew um, from that relationship that he built. Okay, go ahead. Thank you. Cooper had attempted ice hockey, but it was too difficult for him. So we looked into street hockey clinics uh, locally and discovered that there was one that had been shut down. So we went to our Parks and Recs office and worked with them to assist in starting a skills and drills hockey camp. And that's some pictures of that as well. Um, this is the third year for that camp and it's still going strong. We've met new people with the same, um, the same passions and the same things that Cooper loves through that camp. So when the opportunity came about for our hockey project, or for our project, I'm sorry, we knew that it had to be hockey. Cooper designed the logo for the shirts. We partnered with other local agencies, including our Parks and Recs. Um, we had about 100 people in attendance, lots of new faces. We all had a great day just playing. And we said yes to this project because of the opportunity to share Cooper's love for hockey with everyone in our community. And we also had the hope for um, connecting him with others. Go ahead. So our project gave Cooper and myself the opportunity to share a common focus in planning the event. He's 15 years old. He has typical 15 year old challenges. I have my own mother of a, of a 15 year old challenges as well. Um, and for a while, our relationship felt a strain from him, from me being the person who was always the one to take care of the hard things. I would make him take his meds, make him do blood work, having surgery, um, making sure to care for all of his health care needs. And this project gave us permission to focus on something positive together instead of all the negative. 
Um, I have and will always be an advocate for him, but recently he's found his own voice and he's becoming an advocate for himself and for others. But thank you. Um, so looking back at the pro now at the project, what it really meant to our family, the word that comes back to my mind is always growth. We've come a long way in the process of connecting with our community. We started this journey with Cooper and I struggled with a feeling of loss of control. I wanted to help him overcome life's obstacles in any way that I could, but moms never want to see their children suffer. When a doctor tells you there's nothing you can do about your child's condition and it will gradually worsen through his lifetime, it's hard to deal with that. So I thought to myself that I had to do something. We were on the MDA telethon, sad, sad picture, right? <laughs> Um, the first year that we got Cooper's diagnosis and we started very successful fundraisers to benefit the Muscular Dystrophy Association. And that's our friend Dave Fouch up there in the top. We did fill the boot, everything MDA that we could come up with. Um, we raised thousands of dollars for a cause, but I came to the realization that it was a, wor though it was a worthy cause, I came to the realization that the message we sent to our community was one of pity. Every time I read this to myself, I lose myself right at that spot. Um, we had support from friends and family, but I think now that it was all focused on what Cooper couldn't do instead of what he could do. I unintentionally stood on a stage with a microphone and said the words that portrayed, portrayed please take pity on my kid. Don't see him for what he can be, only see his disability. And his opportunities are very limited. What we should have been saying to our community was that this is my son, he is valuable, and he can accomplish his goals. He has gifts and talents and he will succeed. That's what the project says to our community. We're here, we're valuable, and now we are creating an identity for him beyond his disability. The future for this project was that we know our project will be the beginning of a continual hockey league in our city, which means long term for Cooper to be able to be involved in this community, make new relationships and be involved with um, with peers. So my message, I think, is that slide seven? Okay. My message is I want people to know that things like this don't have to be hard. We can bring people together with similar interests and gifts and it can be easy. So after this project, um, we've now met another hockey buff um, in our relation in our neighborhood just from my kid being out playing in the yard, you know, playing in the driveway, playing hockey. We met a new guy and he's on board and wants to come to the to the camps and that's really cool. Um, we're on the third year of the camp and the third week for this camp. Um, so we've built new relationships. Cooper's a lot more confident. He's working on getting his driver's license and hopefully getting a job so that he can have some more cash to buy some more jerseys. <laughs> so, thank you, Rachel. I'm gonna show, there's a little video too. Oh yeah, click it. You want to do it? It's only 57 seconds. 57 seconds. Yeah. Watch what's your You're the timekeeper apparently. Seven minutes is all I have. Jamie, are you able to do that? I think I closed out of that one. Sorry. You can minimize that. Um, I'll make mine. I'm going to shut that over real quick. I don't know why that's on. Well, maybe we can send the video link. Would that work if it's right here? Or you've got, oh, Jay, you're working on yeah, it. Sorry. Right. Okay. <laughs> How quickly that happens, you know? <laughs> technology and before we miss the moment let's take a second and just offer back are we good is that good we can watch it that's right
when a friend of mine told me about Starfire and the mission of what Starfire offers, um, I, I thought, you know, this is right up my alley. My son Cooper loves hockey. He has since the fourth grade when an amazing teacher who's now a really great friend of our family came into our lives. Well, hockey means a lot. Hockey has meant a lot of growth for me, a lot of peace. It's been a place where I can connect with other people and make great friendships and learn from them, not just hockey skills, but life skills. For our family to do the project, of course, we knew it had to be based around hockey. Um, Cooper designed the logo of that t-shirt. We partnered with other local agencies, including our Parks and Recs, and just had a day full of hockey. Second. Wonderful. And there's the video. So, um, Rachel, thank you very much for sharing. And we kind of want to, one, honor the fact that that's not easy to do a project. It's not easy to talk about it um, in front of us all. So we just kind of want to take uh, a little time for each of us. If there was something that you heard that's really, you know, that you heard that you appreciate in that story that Rachel shared, to kind of acknowledge the work and the growth that she and her family had. So online, Zoomers, or in the room, um, what'd you hear that really meant something to affirm their good work? Your raffle ticket, if you see Yeah, um, yeah I got them already. Go ahead. Um, I think recognizing your son for what he can do and not on his disability, I think is just really great for everyone, but also for the community to see. So recognizing what people can do and how that's not always what we do. A lot of, especially I think in the system, a lot of it, we focus on the can'ts and what we need to fix. Thank you. What else did you guys hear? I mean, I just thought it was cool that you actively went out. Like, you always advocated for the opposite that things go up that wasn't even a thing anymore. And you had it all start to back up again. It's been going strong for three years. And it's cool to know that things like that are possible because sometimes there are, it seems like there is no options for people compared to what their interests are. So I thought that was cool that you found that side of that. And that's good to know. That's nice. <laughs> yeah. So appreciating that we can be advocates for a lot of different things. This is including good stuff. Um, Aaron Johnson on Zoom said everyone has an opportunity. Thank you, Aaron. Anything else? Any other thoughts? It's cool just hearing about all the connections that he's made just from doing something that he loves. Like that's what we talk about all the time. And so it's just cool to see it in action. <laughs> Makes it real. <laughs> <laughs> this is real. that he's made and this kind of jump-started his progress of being less and less of an isolated person. You know, you know, just to do now, I think a lot of that's come from seeing all these other people and it's like this. Small steps can lead to really big change. Yeah. Job interview, right? Whoa. <laughs> changes for him, changes for you. It changes everyone, right? And all of these different experiences, they all, they add up to change and to different perspectives, which is important. And a lot of what we're talking about today. And more connections for Rachel and her family and more connections for the neighbor who likes hockey, right? So it's a win, 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 win. Rachel, first of all, thank you for bringing a story of the future. I mean, that's what we need, right? We need to know what our work looks like in 20 or 30 years, right? What are we working toward? We're not there yet, we all know that, and that's okay. But when we get a glimpse of it, like now, 
we can imagine that Cooper's life looks different from some of the lives that we might have witnessed. And that's, that's good. That's good for our, for, our, for our work. I just also got to say thank you for the courage to take an honest assessment of your own participation in the past. Nothing could be more important than saying, as my Angela reminds us, I did then what I knew to do. Now that I know better, I do better, right? Mm -hmm. And so having the courage to say that to yourself, <laughs> to Cooper, <laughs> to us, it's just you have steel in your spine, right? And that's what it takes. And that's what today is about. Kristen, could you pull up the Prezi, please? Sure. Kristen's learning new things, too. <laughs> So we're going to jump right into it. And the first thing that I want to say is just that some of this stuff that we've talked about last time and next time and time we've got in November, you can Google, right? So we're sharing this. We want you to take a picture of it. We want you to be able to uh, research it yourself um, and know that some of today's ideas come from these people. We didn't invent them, but we have learned them, incorporated them, and kind of mixed them all together. So if you want to go on your own learning journey, you can do it with this, and we'll send this to you, Pam, so you can get it out to everybody. Okay. So we just want to give props to our mentors and the people that have taught us a lot about this work. Next. And I wonder if anybody knows who this is. This is Ai Weiwei. He's an artist, and he's actually from China. However, he's been kicked out by the Chinese government because he keeps doing art that calls out the Chinese government. Okay? Ai Weiwei, in particular, did a project, next slide, Kristen, about this earthquake, you might have heard about it, happened in 2008 in the Sichuan province in China. Thousands of people died. 5,000 children died in this earthquake. And what they found out was that when they kind of did their assessment, the buildings that the schools were built had about half the amount of rebar that they needed. Okay. You know what rebar is, right? When you pour concrete, you put the strong kind of steel bar in there. They had about half the amount of rebar they needed, and they found out that that was part of cutting corners because the way business gets done is the government and the business leaders are in cahoots to trade off favors and get kickbacks. So there's a high level of corruption, and this led to building schools that didn't have enough rebar to survive the earthquake, which led to 5,000 children dying. So Ai Weiwei, who lives abroad and is not there at this time, sends in some friends. And he says, go collect the rebar that's left in the wreckage and bring it out and send it to me. And tell everybody you're just recycling. All right, so that's what happens. He sends his friends in, they collect the rebar from this tragic rubble, and they send him the rebar. Next slide, Kristen. And he creates this work of art, which he straightened all the rear bar out. And if you look at it from the side, it's in the shape of a Richter scale pattern. Okay? But the most important part about this art exhibit is his artist's statement. He says, we do not have steel in our spines to stand up to the corruption that is killing our children. So he's calling us out and he's saying, what are we going to do about the fact that we're letting our own personal economic selfish interests destroy our future generations? So we're going to talk about his example a little bit because we think, next slide please, Kristen, you have also people in your life that have steel in their spines. One of them is in the room with us. 
She just told us the story. So think about someone that you personally know who came before you and has stood up on behalf of others. This can be anybody. And remember, you gotta personally know, okay? So a lot of times people are like, oh, Jesus and Martin Luther King Jr. And it's all wonderful. And we all admire those people and appreciate them. However, we want you to personally know them. All right. So groups of, what do you think? Three. Three? Two, yeah. Three. Groups of three? Pretty close. Let's hear. Talk about it. This. Who do you personally know? Who had steel on their spots? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to show you. The next slide. So we all know someone, and what we're asking you to do is for the rest of our time today, just kind of bring them into the room with you. Okay. And if you would, just imagine that they're standing right behind you. And they're kind of put that hand right here, right? And then what they do is put their hand right there and just say, you got this. Kyle, you're good. Kristen, you're fine. Aaron, we're going to be good because we do have steel in our spines. May we become them. All right. So last time we were together, we talked about this pattern. And we talked about, like, you know, this is a pattern that is insipid. It's, it's insidious. It's throughout our entire system. It really does impact people with disabilities. It impacts the mindset of families, parents. It impacts us as a system and how we think about our work and ourselves. And it impacts the community and how they think about disability. So one of our questions is, why is this happening? And go ahead, one more. I'm going to tell you four ways we let ourselves off the hook <laughs> before we get into the ways that why I think it's happened. The first reason, the first way we let ourselves off the hook sounds like this. Well, families just want to, you know, send their kids off to have somebody else do them. You've ever heard that one? Yeah. There's probably some need for support. There's a legitimate underpinning of that, but it's not really why this is happening. There's another kind of story we tell ourselves less off the hook, which is that, uh, well, the system's all full of greedy bastards that just wanna, you know, make as much money and they're gonna monetize human beings with disabilities. And um, that's why we're in this pattern. Wait a minute. Maybe there might be, like, there are some people that are, we, we all know, we've had colleagues that were kind of like, oh, no, they're really for women, right? But that's not us, because it's awesome. <laughs> Here's the other way we let ourselves with a hook. Well, all those people in the community are just a bunch of bigots. They hate people with disabilities, and they really don't get it. Okay. Again, there might be some underpinning currents that are kind of consistent with maybe there are some 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 legitimate discrimination that people with disabilities are up against but generally we find that when you find hockey in common you find out that neighbors are willing to talk to each other right this is the big one though that i found that we let ourselves off the hook well, all those people with disabilities like being around each other because they like to be around people like themselves. I like to be around people like me, right? We say that, don't we? Here's that one. And that's the one that I have a hard time finding the underpinning. I can't really get my, my, my head around. I used to say it a lot, but I can't really believe it anymore because I want to know what people like me means. For me, it's a different story than if I get labeled as people with disabilities. There's a privilege issue here. So I think this is the big one, but we're letting ourselves off the hook if we just blame those things, all right? So here's what's really happening, I think. The first is we're stuck in a rut, <laughs> a path that has been worn, kind of like wagon wheels, right? Like it just wears a path and you can't go outside of that path. Uh, the example I always use is this one. You guys got, you know what a QWERTY keyboard is? Q-W-E-T-R-Y, it's across the top of your keyboard. That's weird, isn't it? A, B, C, D, E, F, G is kind of the, that's supposed to be the first thing, but for some reason our keyboards are QWERTY. Do you know why? 
when the typewriter was invented, the typists were going so fast on ABCDEFG that they were locking up the hammers. So they had to slow down the typists or else the typewriters wouldn't work. Now, get out your phones and see if you can lock out your hammers on your QWERTY <laughs> keyboards. <laughs> 200 years later, we're still using QWERTY keyboards because of fast typists in the 1800s. We're stuck in an old story. I think that's kind of what we're dealing with. We just get inherited a system in a way of thinking, and we just kind of recreate because that's what it was. So part of this is to tell you, this is hard work. You're breaking out, Rachel, you and Cooper are breaking out of a rut that's been laid by thousands of years of human history. It's not easy, right? Next, Kristen, please. You guys know this one. It's money. Literally, we get compensated to group people with disabilities, right? How do you know anything about that? Well, because I did it. <laughs> and I can tell you right now that one person, $7 a day, is not, it's illegal for me to try to pay a staff under what I get. So if I wanted to do one on one work, I'd be violating labor laws, right? Which is weird because people with disabilities get their labor laws violated all the time. But we'll talk about that. <laughs> anyway, so the more people with disabilities I can shove in the room, the more money I can make. And that is something that we have to deal with. Yeah. Are we supposed to evacuate? No. What's your ringtone? Oh my gosh, did it again. Sorry. My, this is the second time it calls 911. Oh, They heard what we were talking about. They're like, uh, <laughs> <laughs> we're going to fill the <laughs> provider and we're discussing what's going on. <laughs> Somebody <laughs> call the <laughs> FBI. <laughs> They showed up at my house. Jamie's the mole. Oh, <laughs> <understand. laughs> <You're sorry, Jamie. laughs> <You're sorry. laughs> but this is what's happened, right? Oh is that we have these financial pressures. How do we maintain the structures that we have built up? And it's not easy. So again, we're up against a really difficult historical thing, and we're trying to change it. So this is just the legacy we've been handed, and we've got to figure it out. So one, yes, we're stuck in a rut, social story, and we are also under a lot of financial pressure. So let's go next, Kristen. But today what we're gonna talk about is this, these are big words too, unspoken, we don't talk about this. Historic, it's been going on for a long time. Systemic, it's in our system. And cultural, it's in our culture. Evaluation see people with disabilities as less valuable than people without disabilities. Okay. Unspoken, historic. So we're going to speak <laughs> about it today. That making sense so far? All right. Okay, so we're going to just talk about a good life, right? Um, it's your mission statement. I think it has a fulfilling, fulfilling one. Um, so along that way, we've got a good life up here. And the things that have been somewhat defined as big buckets of what everybody needs to make a good life. They are choice, dignity and respect, love and relationships, home and family, education, work and self-support, decent standard of living, ability to contribute, and a sense of belonging. So those are all the big categories of things that I think John Bryan and other people have written about. And these are the big things that we've got to focus on if we're looking at what makes a good life or a fulfilling life. Everybody's gonna have different sizes of those, right? To start with when we meet them. Uh, but those are the important things. And we know, um, you can move on, Chris. So part of what we're gonna talk about today is a bit of how do you get that good life and what's in it for you? And one of the terms that we have is valued social role. So some of the roles that people play and those titles that people get in their life. Um, so that's, these roles are really how we get known and how we're known by others. And a lot of times we use them. What we learn about people is pretty much where we put you in our uh, thinking and our brain. How do we categorize you on the, you know, what place do you hold in society or in my life? And you know, what's your value here? 
what do you do for a living, right? Like, isn't that the most common, like, oh, so what do you do, right? So right there. In Cincinnati, there's an ongoing joke of what high school did you select? Sort of an intern, like Cincinnati, like everybody asks what high school you went to, right? So what are those questions that people ask that overall is sort of a sizing you up? I'm trying to get to know who you are and, you know, what do you have to offer me? What can I offer you? For better or for worse, this is what we do, right? You guys agree? I'm not off track. Um, so these roles can be chosen or they're imposed upon us. So, so I was born in Kentucky. I had nothing to do with being a Kentuckian. just happened to me. Um, I'm the youngest, all right? So there are things, people's skin colors, things like that, that are just happened to you. You had no choice in them versus things that we choose to do, right? What path, of, what path, career path did you take? Did you go to a high school? Did you go to college? All of those choices that you make that sort of, again, are more of those things that we line up. Um, you know, what do you do beyond your work? But if I'm a I'm a member of a very serious book club that meets at a bar, right? Like, but I'm a book club member. I do things at the community. I run a community garden. So there's other things that I have that you would know and could probably size me up as we talk, right? To figure out who am I and what am I doing. And what we know is that these roles do impact our good life. So thinking about those buckets of dignity and choice, depending on the number of roles that you've chosen and those that have been imposed upon you. The more those negative ones that exist, those that are not as valued, are impacting your likelihood to have a good life. So. And your social roles also come from the way that society, and we are influenced by society, values certain people and certain stories, right? So who is more valued? Someone with a social role of doctor or somebody with a social role of homeless person? You know? So we have these society's values. So let's take a look at those for a second. Thanks, Kristen. In general, we think that society's values, go ahead, yeah, one more. Come down to one more. Sort of a survival of the fittest mentality, right? We're looking for how to size people up. How do I get as much money, power, sex, stability, whatever helps me to live well and to create a good life for myself? These are some of the things that society values, especially our culture, our society. We value intelligence, right? Everybody's got to go to college. And if you don't, you're a loser, right? We value dominance and power. We really hold CEOs up, right? We really look for people that are able to have a lot of, of autonomy and kind of like they're in charge. Uh, we value health. This is a multi-billion dollar industry that all of us are constantly trying to get more of, right? We're always trying to say, okay, how can I, how can I go to the gym? How can I get another pill? How can I, right? We're always looking to elongate our lives and be healthy. So we value that greatly. Next, Kristen, please. We also value wealth. We look up to rich people. We want to be them. We'll give them tax breaks so that one day we can be rich and get tax breaks, right? We really value the wealthy, especially in our country. We value youth. We in Cincinnati, are, we got to keep the young professionals or else Cincinnati will gray and fade into oblivion, right? But we also really value newness. We're looking for the newest iPhone, the best app to help us, right? figure out what's going on. So everything's got to be new and, and, and happening now. So we also value independence. We have a whole holiday coming up next week around it, right? Pull yourself up by your bootstraps. I did it on my own. I started my own company, you know, all that stuff. Very, very valuable in our society. Yep. We value beauty, another billion dollar industry. How do I look good? There's magazines that we subscribe to. We value athleticism and physical strength. The Olympics, oh my gosh, we're gonna watch them all. And we're gonna pay, you know, Joe Burrow, cause he's awesome and the Bengals are great and we all agree. And we're gonna pay him $50 million a year to do what he does, right? Highly valued. 
and we'll invest like heck in our kids' sports. How much time do we spend watching children play sports? A lot. <laughs> Thankfully, Rachel invented a community sports event where we can all participate. Thank you, Rachel. Um, we value productivity. What's your third quarter? What's your fourth quarter? How are you going to get 3% more next year? You know? How'd you hit your number five versus your four this year on your evaluation? Got to get those numbers up. We value speed. We want it fast, we want it 24 seven. We want to know how quickly we can get that churned out. Can we cut that time down and make it happen more efficient, right? Time is money. Go ahead next. So let's take a second and just play with what are the opposites of these, all right? So go ahead, Kristen. I think this is always illuminating. If you all want to ever like hack Tim's brain, the way to do it is just to say, ask what the opposite of it is. If you've ever asked what the opposite of it is, you can usually get to what you want, or it's a helpful question at least. So the first one was intelligence. We can't see it up there on the screen, but I'm telling you that. Yeah, you can, I fixed it. There we go. <laughs> What's the opposite of intelligent? Unintelligent. Unintelligent, stupid, retarded, Dumb. Right. Huh? Dumb. Dumb, yeah. Opposite of powerful. Weak. 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 Opposite of healthy. Sick. Yeah. Opposite of wealthy. Poor. Poor. Yeah. Opposite of young or new. Old. Old. Outdated. Decrepit. Opposite of independent. Dependent. Poor. Opposite of beautiful. Ugly. Opposite of strong or athletic. Weak. Sure. Yeah. Clumsy. Yeah. Opposite of productive. Lazy, useless. Yeah. Opposite of fast. Okay. Good. All right. So society values. What's interesting is our society doesn't say you got to have all 10 of these things. It says you got to have some. Who can name someone? Let's not name them. <laughs> <laughs> Who can name someone that's athletic but stupid? <laughs> I said, let's not name them. <laughs> who can name someone who is old and wealthy? Right? So the point is, we don't have to have them all. You can have one or two or four or whatever, and you're going to be just fine. What we're talking about and what we're nervous about in our work is if you're seen as having none of them. If you're seen as retarded, weak, sick, or diagnosed, living in poverty, old or outdated or slow or ugly or dependent or feeble or useless, unemployable, slow. If you're seen that way, then how do you get treated? What's the imagination around your life? What's the value that people see for you, right? Are they going to hire you? Are they going to date you? Are they going to ask you to the birthday party? You're overlooked. You're overlooked. Yeah, and you might actually be outcast. You might be shunned. You might be distanced. You might be, eee, don't want to be around those people. Not in my backyard. This is a direct quote from Wolf Wolfensberger, who, it's one of my favorite quotes by him. And he invented kind of social role valorization theory. It's not the functional impact of disability that prevents a good life. It's the social realities, where I live, where I work, who I spend time with. So it's not that I need a wheelchair, it's not that I need someone to help me with my bank account balance. That's the functional impact of disability. The social reality is I'm only ever around people who need wheelchairs, or I'm only ever around people who can't think through their bank accounts. And that's the problem. 
right, the social reality. Let's go next. This is, as Bridget said, you're looking for the good life. And the more that you have these really highly valued social roles, the more that you're seen as intelligent and powerful and wealthy, the more that you get to be doctors and lawyers and county board employees and solid citizens and members of boards and whatever and business owners, and then you get that good life stuff. But the more that you're seen as poor and useless and unemployable and ugly and dumb, the more that you're seen that way, the less social roles you get. Then your social role is client of Starfire, right? Person with a disability person on Medicaid, person who's draining the county's levy system. And then your chances at a good life start to plummet, right? So these things kind of interplay is what we're trying to say here. So we want to talk about devaluation. <clears throat> Anybody have any questions, by the way, on good life and social roles? And does this all make sense? Cool. All right. So devaluation is a big word, as Pam said. <laughs> and we're going to define it here this way. Devaluation is a difference. But it's seen and viewed in a negative way. So we've heard the term diversity, right? That's a difference that has come to be seen as a positive. Wow, we have a lot of diversity. We get a lot of people with different ideas and perspectives, and that's wonderful, and we become stronger because we have diversity. Devaluation is when you say, oh, this person's really different from me. They do not live in a house, or they do not have any money, and they scrape by day to day. Then all of a sudden, it's in a negative way. I don't really know if I want to be around these people, right? It also is as we kind of mentioned, it's kind of like social role, Bridget said, it, it can be chosen consciously or it can be unconsciously baked in. So devaluation, you can choose to devalue somebody. I can choose to say, I want nothing to do with Kristen or David, and that's just, you know, my choice. It also just might be something that you get a mindset around because you grew up where there's no people with disabilities in your classroom. There's nobody with Down syndrome at your college. There's nobody with autism in your workplace. So everywhere where I go to be valued, some people are missing, or I just never even think about them, right? So it becomes an unconscious devaluation. And evaluation is different from not valuable. So this pen is not valuable. I don't care. I could forget it here and wouldn't impact my life. I would go buy a new pen. Devaluation is, I can't stand this pen. It has to be away from me or else. Okay? And this comes back to a psychological phenomenon, which is we want to be one of the cool kids. Right? Think back to high school or grade school. You wanted to be around the kids who were cool. And they wanted to be around each other. And if you were the cool kid, like Bridget, then everybody wanted to be around you. Right? So this is, this is about an active form of devaluation. It's not just like, eh, I, don't, I can take it or leave it, I don't care. And we all have it. We all want to be included because that social status gives us more social roles, which gets us to the good things in life, right? And lastly, devaluation is not about inherent worth. Yes, all of us have inherent worth. We all know it. We all believe it. We all work toward that. What we're talking about is perceived worth. And mostly we're talking about people that aren't in the room. We're talking about our general culture. We have staff to be like, oh, I don't see people with disabilities that way, Tim. I'm, I'm really sorry, Bridger. I don't see them that way. And we'd say, we pay you to see them the way other people see them. Because if you can't do that, you can't enhance their value, right? I mean, you love Cooper. <laughs> But if you're not understanding that other people will accidentally fall into the rut of the social story, then you're not able to kind of counteract that narrative for you, right? So it's important that we're talking about perceived work, all right? Okay. 
you guys don't devalue anybody, <laughs> right? Hmm? Let's see if you do. There's three kinds of evaluation. The first kind is one person up there at the top devalues another person. Does anybody in this room devalue another person? If it's me, do not say so. <laughs> Fill it out in whatever form or feedback and I won't read it. Uh, my cousin-in-law. <laughs> <laughs> so weird. He's a weird dude. He's moving away from you. This is recorded. I can't say who it really is. Oh, okay, good. So like, like okay. Because of all. He's a football fan of Michigan. Right? Who likes those kind of people? <laughs> Anyone don't like those people? And he's in a fraternity, and I can't stand fraternities. And he has these fraternity brothers. I'm just always like, why would you do that? <laughs> and he does this thing with electrolysis, which I did not know what that was, but it's like where he goes to the doctor and gets all his body hair taken off at once. And I don't understand why anybody would do that. But whatever he's also, we don't vote for the same people, so we have a lot that we don't have in common. So he's married to my cousin. And I devalue that guy. <laughs> Thanksgiving, it's like, hi. And then it's go into other rooms and hang out with other people that you want to be around, right? Am I the only asshole in this room? <laughs> Does every, anybody have somebody, just show a hand here yeah. and Zoom please, <laughs> right? Everybody's got somebody that they devalue. It's not really a great thing to have, to admit to, but we all do it. And it's not the kind of devaluation we're talking about because guess who likes my cousin-in-law? Is my cousin, that's right. And Michigan football fans. And other hairless people. <laughs> His doctor really appreciates it, right? I mean, there are a lot of people pushing up. So he he has a great job. He's a doctor himself, right? He's got kids. He is loved. He's got an education. His good life is not impacted by my evaluation of him. That's what we're talking about. Next, Kristen. The second kind of devaluation is when one person devalues a group of people, right? So where I'm from in Northern Kentucky, there's a, a school called Fort Thomas Highlands and they've won 18 state football championships. And then my growing up, it was, you've got to be Highlands. That's where your mom went and they are better than everybody. Please, and we go every year and they trounce us. My junior year, they'd be a 73 to nothing, <laughs> right? You know what that feels like? Right. Everything. And you know what they do? They fire off a cannon every <laughs> touchdown. Oh, oh, and how many God. times can you do the math? How many times you hear a cannon when you lose 73 to nothing? It's 10 plus a field goal, <laughs> right? Anger is the fire, which I hate these people. <laughs> to the point that there was. The guy that shot up the cannon about 10 years ago blew his two middle fingers off. And I took a screenshot of that article and sent it out to all of my friends and family from Fort Thomas. It said, serve you right. <laughs> this is karma, as Taylor Swift says. State troopers, right? I drive by, I see them, I'm just like, boo, you should not be doing this. We just kind of devalue groups of people, right? So if he came up and said, Tim, this is my best friend, he's really awesome. He actually played football at Highlands and he's a state trooper, I would say. Oh, yeah. So you also get electrolysis, right? <laughs> so the point is, is you can think of some groups of people you do that. Jamie already said, Michigan football fans, right? I didn't say it. Yes, I had married to a Michigan Implied it. But again, this is recorded, so. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> <You know. laughs> Who in here thinks of a group of people you're just like, oh. Yeah, right? Some people you just you don't even know, but you just feel that way about them. As much as I can't stand Highlands football players for Fort Thomas and State Troopers, they still have jobs. They still have families. They still have love and belonging. They still have status in our communities. They still have lots going on. Mind evaluation. 
even when we're talking about serious, sorrowful, painful devaluation, racism, sexism, homophobia, religious bigotry, even that stuff, as toxic and horrible as it is, one person's devaluation doesn't necessarily hurt an entire group's good life. Let's go next, Christy. So this is the devaluation that we're worried about. This is the one where it's a big group of people in our society are devaluing a smaller group of people in our society. And there's not very many people sticking up for them. We've got some examples in our history of this. Let's hear them. When did you see, when, when, when do you know this happened in our history? The Holocaust. The Holocaust. A bunch of people, 100 million Eastern Europeans, say, it's okay with us. We're going to stand by and let 6 million people die. Not many people stood up. There weren't very many rescuers. Where else? Segregation. Yeah, sure. Slavery, right? Even in, in the very beginning of our country, enslaved people were said to be a literal devaluation. That's three-fifths of a person. Literal. And not many people stood up and said, we shouldn't be doing this. And we're, these things aren't done yet, right? They're still happening in a certain degree. But the question you can ask, if you're, if you're looking for whether this is happening, put yourself in the position of the people in the middle of that that are being devalued and say, would I tolerate that as my life? So this kind of devaluation has three aspects to it that are important to notice. The devaluation is pervasive. It's everywhere. It's societal wide. It's culturally wide. It's systemically wide. It is perpetual. It keeps happening over and over and over, generation after generation after generation. It doesn't stop. And it is potent, meaning that it really harms the lives of the people that are being devalued. We can agree. Holocaust victims' lives were devalued. Enslaved people's lives were devalued. And I think, go ahead. Yeah. We can look at that and say, would I tolerate this as my life? And I think that, that we asked this question in February. Would I tolerate this as my life? Would I say I'm okay? with a segregated life, but I say I'm okay with a life that's limited by my label. And I don't remember anybody's hand coming up. So we think this is the kind of devaluation that people with disabilities are up against. So we're gonna talk about this next part. It's gonna be difficult because we're gonna talk about some of the specific ways that devaluation steps up around people with disabilities. And we will tell you, we're here to talk after. Um, we also can talk later. And, and at the end of today, we'll get into some hopeful ways. And next time in August, we'll get into some hopeful ways to act as well. But I think now would be a good time for a quick five minute break. That sound good, Rich? Okay. Five minutes, come back, we'll get going. <coughs> get your steel and your spines ready. I'll get some sustenance. Um, as I said, this is the hardest part. It's hard to hear. It's hard to think about. But it's worth it, guys. It's worth it. This is where we need to steal in our spines because if we don't know what we're in, we don't know how to do something different, right? All right, Kristen, let's get going on this. So we're going to talk about next. It's coming. Oh, it's coming up right here. Oh, it? oh, it's just delayed. It's the next one. It's a big circle. We're going to talk about specifically. I go back this one. Yeah, that one. Okay. That one's good. We're going to talk about some of the devalued roles and some of the images that are in our cultural waters. Okay. Um, 
One way to think about this is this. I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell you nine of them, okay? And we'll play with them in a second. But these nine are not all of them. There's, there's more, but I think they're pretty good as far as uh, uh, buckets to explore. Here's how to think about this. We're gonna look at what historically has happened and, and we're gonna think about whether it's still going on today. One of the tricks of this kind of devaluation is that it changes and grows, right? The institution got shut down. Well, the big scary <laughs> ones that they use in horror movies got mm -hmm. shut down, right? But it morphed and grew into something that feels different. And the trick is, if we're not really paying attention to how that same form and those same effects have happened, we, we tend to think, all right, we shut down all the big scary buildings, we're all good, right? So part of the trick is to ask, was it alive previously and is it alive today? And if the answer is yes to those questions, we can assume that it will be alive in the future unless we check it, unless we recognize and do something different. So we're going to go through those. So you're just going to notice how they're alive, alive today and in the past. So let's hit the next one. This is the first one. You guys have seen it. We've talked about it a thousand times, but it's the granddaddy, grandmammy of them all, right? <laughs> the grandparent of them all. I have a friend in Georgia, and he calls this with their own kindism, which I think is a pretty good Georgian term for what we're talking about. Those people belong with their own kind. And that leads to what we know as, in our field, as congregation and segregation. Congregation is bring everybody with a disability together. Segregation is separate them from the community. We're a little more afraid of that word segregation than we are congregation, but they both have the same effect, okay? So we, we know that historically, segregation, congregation, with our own kindism, is alive, right? And we've talked about how it's still alive today. Okay, next. Another assumption about people with disabilities, not just that they're all alike, but that they're all so dangerous. This is a page from a book in Cincinnati that came out in 1906. The Feeble-Minded, or the hub to our wheel of vice, crime, and pauperism. So people with disabilities were causing all of Cincinnati's problems workhouses, charities, city hospitals, infirmaries, juvenile courts, house of refuge. So they had to be locked up. So 120 years ago, this is how Cincinnati thought of its problems. Well, we could just get the feeble-minded locked up. We'd be more out of This was eugenics, right? It also is still alive. On my first day of work, I was trained how to take my hand in the shape of a C and put it behind someone's shoulder and put my front foot in front of their body and push them to the ground. And this was called nonviolent crisis prevention. <laughs> crisis intervention. So what did I think about those people? They were trouble, they were violent. I was gonna have to control them. Right. I was asked in my first job interview to work at a camp, what if somebody bit you? That was a job interview question. Right. Before we've ever met anyone. Right. So all of a sudden, we've got this cultural story. There's an Agatha Christie mystery, and it's the person with the disability who's the suspect because he has the body of a man and the mind of a child, and he doesn't know his own strength. Right. This is mice and men, Lemmy and George. Right. It's in our culture. I have a guy who committed some vandalism at his group home. The group home threw the book at him. The judge in Cincinnati sent him to two years at the Pickaway County Correction Center. And the judge, his name was Stephen Martin, I never forgot because it's like the comedian, and he has a joke. He said, I quote to my friend, I used to be able to send people like you away forever. You're a danger to our community, but I can only give you two years, and I regret that. A judge. <laughs> in our modern times said that about a person with a disability. Used to be able to send you people away, right? So we know that people have been seen as dangerous in the past and that people with disabilities are seen as dangerous now. 
and they're all seen as all white. Next, please, Kristen. We also know that people with disabilities go ahead, are seen as a burden on their society or their family. So this is from 1917, the Chicago Daily Tribune. Baby dies, physician upheld. And if you zoom in one more, Kristen, you'll see that the headline there is that the autopsy of this baby with a disability put the boy in the class of defectives. Okay, so a baby's born, has a disability, nurses try to save it, doctor says, please let it die as a drain on society. This is eugenics, right? We do not need this baby. Eugenics, good genes. So we're trying to get rid of bad genes. And this led to the Holocaust, right? And that's why we don't talk about it, but this was a big thing in America from the 1880s till the Holocaust, of course. Anyway, the judge finds that the doctor's not liable, that this is perfectly fine to allow this little baby to die because we don't want defectives to be in our world. Is this still alive today? Iceland is trying to get their births of people with Down syndrome down. And this article says they took it from six in 2016 <laughs> to five in 2017. And I'm not sure where they are, but we know where they're headed. Right? So we've got this story that people with disabilities are such a burden that we can't even allow them to be born. Please, next, please. And they're all like each other. And they're all dangerous. Oh, Rachel teed us up for this. We see people with disabilities as objects of our charity. That's my first job, Camp Harmon, Easter Seals Camp in California. When I showed up, I got hugs and high fives from everybody out there. It's the most loved I've ever felt in my life. Sorry, mom, dad. It's true. And then I came back to Starfire and said, I want more of that. So I opened a building full of 150 people that could give me hugs and high fives every single day, right? What's kind of fucked up is that I'm getting my social juice from people that I'm actively segregating to get it, right? And it's not just me. A lot of us are using people with disabilities simply as a way to feel good about ourselves. We volunteer, we donate. Please, next. We share videos, next, about the water boy with Down syndrome that we allowed to score the fifth quarter face touchdown. And we don't ask, well, what he's, what's he doing every other Friday night? What's he doing after he graduates? Who's going to be at his wedding? Who's inviting him to the bar for a beer on his 21st? But we feel pretty good about ourselves. Next. When we share the video about the water boy who made six three-pointers in a row, and the stupid coach should have been playing them all four years <laughs> in the last game, right? But again, we feel good about ourselves. People treat these people like dirt. Proms for those with special needs are going to draw 115,000 people. This is wonderful for one night. What's happened in the other 364 nights of the year? And I love this picture because this shows what I think this is all about. Go ahead, Kristen. Which is that? Oh, isn't that sweet? <laughs> Who wants to put money on whether or not she has their number for what they're going to do tomorrow after the big dance, right? Next, please. So this object of charity and pity puts people with disabilities in a place where they're not even their own person. They're just people for us to get social media points, people that help us feel good about themselves, ourselves. And the question is, is there something better? Sure, the problem's fine, but isn't there something better? Sure, the dance is great, but something better, something more. We're not there yet, right? There's a story that people with disabilities are a gift from God or the holy innocent, right? Angels sent from heaven, Rachel, and you're the only one that God chose. You know how many times I've heard that? How many? Lots. Mm -hmm. What's that do? 
What's that do to start? Yeah. <laughs> so this is a this is a very old story, right? I mean, literally, we have stories of where Pergam, I think, is the story, and he chooses to bless the person with a disability, right? And so we want to be like Jesus, so we're going to get closer to the people with disabilities. And early monks and Christians used to kiss the open sores of lepers to prove that they were closer to God and more like Jesus. Now, people with disabilities become heaven-sent. Camp Hill communities, they're out and run kind of like camps for people with disabilities, farms for people with disabilities. Well, they're all built on the Waller School, Rudolf Steiner's idea that people with disabilities are spirits sent from God to test us all out. And then we get to decide whether we go to heaven based on how we treat them. So there's a story historically that people with disabilities are a gift from God, still alive. And what happens is they don't get to be themselves. Again, they're objects of heaven points. God helps, I get to get close to God by using this person. Right? It's kind of, kind of, again, it's kind of messed up. Next, please, Chris. Another story that people have about people with disabilities, our culture does, is you can see the Oops, Down syndrome of Nova Scotia, that they are a patient. They are their file for. They are a diagnosis, that they're halfway dead. Right? So if you could zoom in there, Kristen, next. This is Willowbrook up in New York. This was one of the big scary institutions. They ran tests on people with disabilities who lived there to try out the hepatitis vaccine. And the reason they did it was because their lives are already over. We're going to use them to develop this vaccine to save the troops overseas and then save society. Right? So people literally are seen as half dead, not alive, worth trying things out on, and people end up used as scientific and medical experiments. Next. This is a picture from the first few months of COVID-19 in New York. As you'll notice, everybody with a disability in this picture is not wearing a mask. Everybody without a disability in this picture is wearing a mask. Out of all of COVID-19, we learned a lot of lessons. I learned one big lesson which is the most dangerous worry COVID-19 to me was just. Well, it just, it only just affects the old people. It just impacts people with disabilities. It just hurts those people with medical conditions. So in a way, what we were saying was, it sucks, but people that were already kind of halfway off, that's all we're gonna lose. That's good news. That was the story we kept telling about ourselves. Go ahead next, Chris. People are seen as subhuman or disposable or an object. Um, animal therapies. The horse understands them better than people do. He connects more with the dogs and the dolphins than he does with people. Right? Am I the only one that hears this? It's something that gets said. It's something that gets done, right? We could all connect around and with each other fully human and with the animals perfectly fine. But the difference is, is that we accidentally dehumanize people and we act as though they're not fully human relatable. Walk into a restaurant in the waitress or waiter talks to you instead of a person with a disability, right? Not even a human that I'm going to talk to. Where should we put the wheelchair in our system? How many slots do we have, right? We start to dehumanize people and they become objects. This is a group of people 
at one of the institutions tied down. And here's a quote from our history, Aristotle, the founding grandfather of democracy. With, the re with, with regards to the rearing of children, let there be a law that no deformed child shall live. So we've got a 2300 year old story that our world is better off if we treat people with disabilities in a way that sends them away. Next, please. So they are subhuman and they are a condition and they are a danger and they are a charity case and they are a gift from God and they are uh, all like each other. Right? You're starting to see it pile up, right? These are all the things that human beings with disabilities and their families are up against. And that's what we as a system are up against too. We got to know about this stuff so we can combat it. There's an idea that people with disabilities are all like silly little buddies that I'm going to joke around with. These are the campfire clowns. Before Starfire was Starfire, it was campfire. And we would send people with disabilities dressed as clowns into nursing homes. This was before our times. So yeah, we did not we do that take shit. credit for this one. <laughs> but we're not going to say we haven't done things like it. Okay. But I have a friend with a disability. He's down this Down syndrome, and he works at a down at a, at a uh, as an architecture firm downtown. And uh, very fancy place. Lots of people know him there. They're all college educated. One day I picked him up for lunch. He says, I won the dance competition. He said, that's weird. And I said, who was in it? He says, just me. And I said, what does that look like? He's like, they were always courting me, giving me high fives. So an architecture firm full of people with professional degrees and a man with Down syndrome dance for them. The CEO played the music while they all filmed it, right? So yes, it's in our history. And yes, it's still alive in downtown Cincinnati. Sure glad it's only there. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> it's only it's it's it. That's right. We're the only people that do that shit. <laughs> all right, <laughs> next. There's also this idea that people with disabilities are eternal children. <clears throat> this is me as Santa Claus at a dance for 50 to 70 year old people with disabilities in uh, 2003, four or somewhere around there. I dressed up like Santa Claus more than once. <laughs> just that one. Yeah. Just the holiday dance. So <laughs> historically, we've assumed that they'll never grow up. They have right a mental IQ, or what do they say, of the mental age. Well, they're really 18, but uh, mental age two. So we just kind of like infantilize people. We call them Timmy instead of Tim, Pammy instead of Pam. Oh, like Pammy. <laughs> <laughs> like, when I was 12, I told my family I was coming out as Tim, and it was a big controversy, yeah. right? <laughs> you can imagine if your whole life is Timmy, where that leads. But part of that is just kind of the ways we think about it and the ways we process what this really means. Still alive. Talking in a higher voice. Yes, very good. That's wonderful. <laughs> and louder, right? Yeah. 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 Right. So go back one more there, Kristen, and we'll get to that in a second. I was so used to the. Oh, that's fine. That's fine. Okay. So all these are troublesome. Um, but together, they're dangerous. Together, they allow us to just send people away. We've got a whole host of reasons to do it. Together, they allow us to be detached from people. We don't take their lives seriously. That's what I was doing here, right? I wasn't hurting anybody by dressing up like Santa Claus, but I wasn't taking their life seriously. And I take a deep breath and I say, at this point, at this dance would have been three people. Jenny Wetzel, Sarah Naylor, and Michael Standifer. I ran alleys with them, get overnights with them. They came to dances. And one night, Jenny's mother laid down in bed and shot Jenny and shot herself. Went to her funeral. They played on eagle's wings. I can't remember it. One 
night, Michael's mother dosed him with morphine and herself. He died, she lived. She's still in jail for his murder. One day, Sarah's mom stabbed her and burned the house down with herself in it. So three people and their mothers that I know that were coming to our outings and coming to our day programs and coming to all the stuff that we were working our tails off to do, couldn't see that somebody was taking their lives seriously enough to prevent that. Right? So I always wonder, is there something more we could have done? Is there something different that we could have done that would have helped those moms feel a little bit more hope, right? So I know it's not a big deal necessarily, but I kind of think it is. I kind of think it piles up. I kind of think that it becomes a story that causes families to lose hope. So what we'd like to do is get to a place where we can think about hope. So Bridges, you gonna lead us through this here, Bridge? Yeah, <laughs> please. Uh, we've got a, uh, each of these nine buckets, we've got a, a, um, a poster for you. And what we're asking you to do is to, what, pair up or what? Um, there are going to be six here. We're going to do three online. I think that's So we're thing. asking you to ID with the partner about what could we do to tell the opposite story? So as you can see, Bridget has a big poster. It's got the word menace crossed out. So you all are going to sit down and just take a few minutes, and you're going to write as many ideas as you can about what can we do to tell the story that's the opposite of menace. You can draw. You can write. We don't care. But we're trying to get into this place of what can we actually do to counteract this old Okay? As many ideas as possible. You all got the one of eternal child. You all get the one of holy innocent. All right, you say it again. No. So you're coming up with as many things and ideas as you can to counteract this story. Oh, okay. 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 I went to check the chat to see if there was a question. It's like just to, to counteract the story. I don't know if it'll work. I know. What is it? Uh, right. Can you hear us at this point? Or? Mm -hmm. can, oh, you guys can hear us? Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to put you guys in rooms and I'm naming your room name will be the topic that you're kind of going to focus on. So one of you guys are going to think about if you're disposable or subhuman. Um, there's another room that's going to discuss the object of ridicule or being silly. And then the other one is like their own kind of to kind of talk about and what are the ways that you can tell a new story. Thank you, Kelly, for giving me that. <laughs> I appreciate it. So we'll open those rooms for you guys to come up with a list of new stories and ways you can counteract that that stereotype.
Okay, that minute's up. Bringing it back together. So what we want to do is just kind of share a quick share out. So on Zoom, I don't know um, I if I warned you, but we're going to need one of you to kind of speak up for us um, when we come to your kind of um, that stereotype. Um, and so just share with us some of what you came up with, what some of those ideas are of the basically the opposite of those, right? What are the stories we need to tell? Um, so let's start uh, with with their own kindism. So that one's a Zoom. Somebody from that group willing to tell us what you came up with? I'm sorry, we didn't hear. I just we just got back from the the group. What did you say? We are. I'm looking for somebody that was in the group or the room that discussed with their own kindism or together to kind of share what those narratives would be the opposite. Well, that was our group. Um, oh, thanks, Kelly. Thanks, yeah. Um, we talked about. We talked about, um, in the, we used the word integration, community, finding own interest groups, but we also at the very end started talking about changing the whole, just changing this, changing the systems like we talked about, and, and it's not gonna happen tomorrow, but making those slow changes to, to welcome. And we talked about bowling. And so everybody goes bowling. Well, what if they, that's all they know, or do we have them join an actual bowling league? That's just not from their day program or just not from their group home. So, but it's, it's going to be a, just like it. Yes. Yeah, it's just going to be a slow fade or a slow, slow move, but it has to, it has to happen. So that's, and I think the, the other person we we're with, we, it's, it's hard for us to, to, to change what we know. And so we're, we're learning with everybody else to change what we know. And I like the inspiration that we're getting from this type of, of meeting. So thank you. Yeah. That's yeah, well, thank you, Kelly. I think we've all, you know, it's a journey and we're all in it. We've all been a part of our society and the values that we grew up with and what we've experienced. We're all in that, right? So um, that's, that's definitely part of this. It's just we, until we can recognize what's going on, we don't know what to change or how to change. Um, but I like those ideas of, you know, to take with their own kind and to acknowledge um, that with their own kind could be with the other people that actually share those interests. Those are what we want to do, right? When we think about where we want to go or who we want to be with, it's the people that share those things. So if we could tell more of those stories, then people would understand how to relate and not assume it's just based on that one devalued image or role. Thank you very much. How about Menace? Well, what are some of the things we can tell to counter out there? That Menace story, that bylaws. Um, uh, so we kind of talked about um, making sure that, like, if you're looking at what our society values, not necessarily that we should base everything off of that, but we putting um, or opening up opportunities where they we can, people have the opportunity to show their goodness. So, I mean, even Rachel and I talked about this a couple weeks ago with someone on my caseload, like having them sit on um, the board somewhere or involving them in community events and having them have a chance to advocate for um, themselves and for others. Um, and then I thought about your story with the judge, um, like equal treatment under the law um, and not, I guess, wanting to put them away for longer because they're assuming that they're going to have a um, wrong again or in the future and then um, education um, for society as a whole and also in schools when you separate people and um, you know or people are seen as others you know you don't get to see them show who they are and then you make kids make assumptions of why are they in a different classroom or things like that and in that like teaching kindness to um, advocating on behalf of anyone right. else who can't advocate for right. themselves or um, teaching them to advocate for yeah. themselves yeah. you know yeah so there's a lot in this um, starting from very young right so that um, we can influence the way people are seeing I can imagine at my kids school right now 
would say they're inclusive, but are there kids that are being put in restraint or being taken away and out of the classroom and from a very young age? What are we thinking? They're too dangerous. They're too wild. <laughs> like, whereas, you know, and once they get that label, we know there's a kind of a, a pretty good um, stream. Like once they get that, they're more likely, to, like, oh, they're always going to be right. Like, we've got that in our mindset, and we keep that up for each individual, but also as a whole. Um, you know, and as well, like, you know, I think you guys said, like, what is the better story? How could people, people that are professionals who don't come across, who are the judges, how can they meet somebody with a disability to change that story? If they're serving on a board, if they're volunteering together, that changes what they may have been thinking or what that experience has been in their past that is tainting the way that they see how it's very much burden. Oh, yeah. I want to show you. <laughs> you can read. No, we did it circular. So you can do it like this. You start here. Like you start there? Yeah. For sure. I thought we should start. Just yeah, start. <laughs> so, what was your question, Bridget? Yeah, what's the new story? What do you do to counteract the bird narrative? I think we have to show people where they're being successful and having accomplishments. Living and working independently as Rachel That's a lunchbox. loves her job. <laughs> mm -hmm. want to share with it. Um, demonstrate whether being healthy and having success at doing things that are demonstrating their good health. Thumbs up. Thumbs up. Uh, or the uh, muscles. That was really supposed to be a muscle. Muscles. It looks like a thumbs up. And in different ways that they, can, they are contributing. Because we know they are. We just overlook that all the time. Yeah. Absolutely. So all of those are more positive story. Um, I think. <laughs> Pam spoke on, you got to do some fundraising and reach out to foundations. How do you do that in a way that isn't like, oh, we're going to kind of overlap it now. But right, like, so how do we do it? We're still allowing people to have um, this independent and people accomplishing goals and dreams, right? So absolutely. So maybe let's jump to object of pity, object of pity and charity. That's what I to say. All right. Um, you focus on people's abilities. Um, stop making the focus on our system. What did I do my last? Mm -hmm. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, having a steel spine, like you guys were talking about, and also teaching people to have a steel spine around, leaving potential, giving opportunity to your gifts, focus on abilities, talents, skills, valuing everybody's contribution, help people make connections to others. With Interest, tell better tell better stories that emphasize the person. Help people obtain employment and something they love. All of it. <laughs> it's all that, right? Um, and I think part of it, I think the whole we got to be creative about what people what and to to acknowledge those gifts and contributions. And some people like we know what a job description looks like, right? Like I think for anyone that's in the job realm. Um, we don't always fit into that, right? So there has to be creative mindsets to think of well, what could we offer, what is the contribution we offer, and it's not always the one people are expecting or maybe what they're asking for, but they will appreciate it if we help. If we have to help get those muscles growing and those creative thinking. Thank you all. All right, what's next? Totally innocent. Mm -hmm. Guys, what you got? Totally innocent. Gift from God. So. Um, we try to kind of focus on that people are equal, so somebody with a disability isn't more equally or innocent than anybody else. So we have our little lovely demonstration here. I think one of her, her drawings. <laughs> so we have people that are equal. Um, and then also um, friendship and reciprocity. So Timmy kind of talked about like, oh, people working with somebody just to get something in return, like, on oh, doing something good. Because, or even just like, you know, we talk about people in the field, like, you can just be like, oh, a special kind of person to do that and like you can have real relationships and real friendships with people with disabilities because people um and then we have them down here we're all growing together contributing there's in a community garden everybody is able to work and, and do things and then um, humans we all experience the all ranges of emotions you know people with disabilities aren't just always happy and joyful they experience all things yeah, I agree. She said something right, right away that I thought was really interesting. It's like with Holy Innocent, how do you demonstrate that without then putting them into one of these other categories as a menace or as a, yeah. Right. Yeah, we don't really need you to go out and get a bunch of MUIs to prove it. Right. <laughs> Somebody's not saying you're not a gift from God. That's not what we're saying. Yeah, yeah. 
100%. I think that one's an interesting one. I think we've all been, I don't know. I remember, the, I mean, when you're out with a group of people, it says, oh, you're such a saint, right? Like how often? And I always knew it felt weird, right? Like I knew it wasn't where I wanted to be and that felt strange. And I didn't know how to respond. I'm not sure I still do. Um, but that's that, right? And that was part of like to understand why that's wrong. I was like, I'm actually getting paid to do something pretty cool, guys. Like, but nobody had to like, have that perspective and how do we change that? Um, Sometimes it's just stop telling the story, right? Sometimes it's just that. And one of the things I learned from parents was that they heard something deeper. When somebody says, God chose you for the special person, what people are actually saying underneath it is, So the counter narrative is to say, well, God chose you too. Now you're in it. Let's get together. <laughs> right? so how do we get everybody to get chosen by God to be in the lives of a person with a disability? I think that's a wonderful thing. And my guess is that's what God wants. So God says, get inclusive. Um, on Zoom, a group that discussed being disposable, subhuman, So we came up with pretty much what everybody else is already saying. Um, we have that focusing on people's strengths and helping them determine goals and then helping them find activities that they want to participate and enjoy participating in. Absolutely. For sure. And being careful of some of these stereotypes as you choose those and knowing some of the way in that counterbalance of some things that people, we do know people who love animals that's fine, but to be really careful around that, knowing this, that there is there is the potential that we could be getting into some troubled waters. Practically at Starfire, we at some point said, we're gonna stop taking pictures of groups of people with disabilities. We're not gonna share those on social media. We're not gonna share those in our newsletter. And then we made another mistake. We started taking pictures of people with disabilities by themselves. They were dressed up and they looked nice. But we realized we still weren't telling the story of connection and full humanity. So now our rule is, for the most part, show and celebrate and share pictures of people with disabilities with other people without disabilities, right? So it's all about the story you tell. And it doesn't mean that there aren't pictures of groups of people with disabilities that don't exist or people with disabilities by themselves, but the ones that we share, the ones that we highlight, the ones that we tell the narrative of are intentionally used as a way, essentially what we're doing is we're marketing. We're marketing people with disabilities as fully human, fully alive, fully connected, fully participatory, fully gifted, fully safe, right? All these things. Uh, on, on Zoom, ridicule, the object of ridicule or silly? You have thoughts? Or not? Okay. Can you hear me? Oh, yeah, we can hear you. Okay, this is Sarah. Um, we talked about that everybody has their a value and they should be praised for the value they have and they should be seen as a valued source and uh, at their own pace and their own opportunities. Everybody is not at the same pace, but everybody has the same opportunities. And we need to bring that out in, in, in uh, making the individuals included. And we need to praise the individuals when they do have a good idea or good input with what we're all uh, being included in. Yeah, thanks for that. I think that's an important, um, if you your whole life have heard, you've been living under these clouds, right? Whether you knew mm -hmm. it or not, as a person with a disability, you have been up against a lot from birth. Um, and to have people praising the, the good things, right? So when you do do something of value, when you are moving forward, right. that is all of, you know, just to say that's an easy step and an important one um, for us all to move forward and keep people moving 
Um, Because there's a lot working against them and that's what we're talking about. Okay, I think we got eternal child. Okay. We can help. We'll work together. Okay. <laughs> so we just talked about, um, you know, just during the day, like offer, like what you do with your life during the day, like opportunities, like employment, being, you know, thinking that people can actually work and that um, they can be socially integrated and they don't have to just be like a, an adult day service program. Um, we feel like that people, um, are put into convenient clothing. So what's easier to change? Yeah, what's the most comfortable? Yeah. Um, and maybe not necessarily like their style or what they want to wear. Um, and then we stole from Catherine when she talked about tone of voice. Um, so exchanging that, you know, you're just talking to them like you would anyone else and not just, you know, raising your voice or talking to them, belittling them, things like that. Um, we talked about food and meal choices. So Tyler had mentioned, like, you don't want to just assume everybody, like, wants chicken nuggets and mac and cheese. Like, maybe they want, would you say, steak, steak and lobster. lobster. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> so their palate of, like, what they would like to eat. Uh, and then changing, uh, being treated age appropriately, like, oh, get your little comfort item, get your stuffed animal. Yeah. And um, that you cannot curse around people that have disabilities. Like, Sam would be in trouble. Yeah, and then, um, or <laughs> yeah. talk about like sex or anything, like people with disabilities are not allowed to have sex. And, um, what does that say? Oh, just adult topics. Topics just in general. general. Adult topics or yeah, topics. or that everyone with a disability likes all Disney movies or child, more child appropriate movies. Um, Safety. Yeah. yeah, keep everybody safe and yeah, exactly. Dressing up as Santa Claus or I, I one time they had me dress up as the Easter Bunny for Easter and take pictures with me. Yeah, and a lot of this I think is, you know, um, we have to be realistic about we as service providers. We are the people out there um, who are the model to the rest of the community. So if we are talking down to someone or if we are um, choosing Disney movies just as a as a default mode versus really questioning that and wondering if somebody actually wants to, and even if they did, is it just because they've only ever had chicken fingers, right? So what has the menu been? What have people been offered throughout their lifetime and what could we do to change? How do we get to know the person to know what it is that they want, they're ready to jump out of that? And I think Tim's talked about being Timmy. We've, I don't know if you all have this experience. When you go home, Right? To feel that you are stuck, like I had, I'm the youngest, that's another role, right? <laughs> it comes with some baggage. How do I get treated by my older brothers and sisters? What do they think of me versus like, you know, I'm pretty capable guys, like I'm not an idiot. <laughs> but that is the role of eternal child. Like we all kind of follow that, but imagine if you have that everywhere. And I think about that a lot. Sometimes I'm like, gosh, I'm so frustrated. I'm like, what if that's what you got? Um, so thank you guys um, for going through those. And just to say this, we kind of put this in to kind of balance out the heaviness of our um, day today and the topics because it is heavy um, and it's a lot to kind of think about. Um, and, but we know it's important. So we just kind of want to offer like to hold the sadness well and to hold these lessons and what we know has happened. Um, some things we were personally, we can look and reflect personally, Ben the Easter Bunny, Ben Santa, took the photos of the people in the suits. Um, what, what have we done in the past and what are we gonna do to move forward? Um, and hopefully this is helping us just kind of take a new lens and to see things with a different perspective and to also be thinking about how this story could change and how we could help people to make choices um, that'll help move their lives forward. Um, so, stealing your spines out of the way. It's, it's a battle, we know that, we are up against a lot. Um, and we just wanna avoid these old stories and we wanna be conscious of what they are and so we can create new ones. And then to think about who else, who else is out there to support us and to support those people with disabilities that we care about so that they can have those new stories. We know that that will change, that opportunity to have a good life and that's what we all want. Thank you all. Nice job. Nice. It's like almost on the money. Nice job. Um, but we will be back. <laughs> so gift cards? Oh, yeah, we got gift cards, too. Speaking of Santa Claus. Yeah. <laughs> no, I do not. Okay. Okay. Um, I'm going to win. <laughs> Number three. Who's 
number three? Debbie Howard. Debbie. Debbie, if you would like, you can choose between Chick-fil-A or Amazon. And let Kristen know. Chick-fil-A. 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 Thank you. Number six. 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 Nope. Six is in this room. Should be. Unless we did this wrong. Is it? Is the no, Did you do the line on the top of the bottom? On the bottom. Well, it's a good try there. Six. Yeah, yeah, six. Well, I was gonna say yeah, that's a nine. Nine. No, I know. I was right there. Where did six go? Okay. <laughs> oh, wait, I do. Oh, sorry. <laughs> it was hidden. It was hidden. Aaron Johnson. So, Aaron, Aaron, Aaron Amazon or Chick fil A yeah. is your choice? I was like, I'm Just, pretty sure you usually do. Hey, tell all the virtual people. We'll take their certificate. We'll make sure they didn't show Oh, I'm muted. <laughs> Hi, Aaron. Hi, I'm still here. I promise. Uh, Amazon. 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 Right. Nice. Number 19. Which one is that? Yes, 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 Eighteen. Oh. Well, right. All right. Thank you guys very, very much for the conversation. We appreciate it. And thanks for your good work. It's 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 important work. I think the world needs it. You know, we'll talk about this in August and we'll talk about it in November. But the gift that people with disabilities are asking to help them give is the gift that our world needs the most which is inclusive communities, which are experiences where people are all valued and contributing, connected to each other. And that's what we need in our world. And that's what's really exciting about it is, I think I always thought of my job as taking care of these people. And now what I see is my job is in collegiality and partnership with people to enliven the world on their hyper local personal level and i can't think of one thing that i would rather do with the rest of my career you know so that's what we get to do but we have to make some significant shifts and then we need to keep showing that's possible thank you thank you thank you, thank you everybody um just a reminder um our superintendent david ull will continue his leadership series uh with part two uh july 26th is our next meeting. So um, we appreciate all of you being here today and we look forward to seeing you uh, next month. So have a wonderful day and uh, I hope you enjoyed today's presentation as much as I did. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you, Kristen. Thank you, Kristen. Excellent.